Hi, everyone. I'm Jane Fleischman. Welcome, all of you, to the fourth episode of season two of our virtual Northampton Neighbors speaker series. Doesn't sound like we're on Netflix or something. We bring you exciting programs each month, and I'm so honored to be a member of this committee. So just a little bit about us. Northampton Neighbors' mission is to help each other maintain independence, dignity, and joy as we age and engage in place. Northampton Neighbors is free of charge and open to all, offering a wide range of social and volunteer opportunities, as well as services and support for members 55 and older in Northampton, Florence, and Leeds. And if you're not a member, please join us. It's free. This is the 20th anniversary of the Village Movement, which was started in 2002 in Boston. And it's turned out not only to be a statewide, but a national movement. Today, Northampton Neighbors is one of 19 operating villages in Massachusetts and one of over 285 across the country. We exist to combat isolation among seniors in our community. So now on to our guest. Dr. Gloria DeFulvio fits right in with us here at Northampton Neighbors. Hi, Gloria. She's currently on her second semester doing some really wonderful intergenerational connecting, which you're gonna hear about in just a moment. She directs the undergraduate program in public health sciences here at UMass. She's a faculty member in the health promotion and policy department and the co-director of the Center for Program Evaluation. She's also doing really great research, focusing on public mental health, including the role of social connection. For the past 13 years, she's partnered with the Mass Department of Public Health to evaluate suicide prevention strategies across the state. Her passion is high impact and engaged teaching. She helps students experience the classroom in a community setting. Last year, she won the Regelman Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Public Health Education, a national award that recognizes faculty for their efforts to start or sustain an undergraduate program and or collaborate with community partners. Amazing, Gloria. Today, she's going to be talking with us about creating connections across generations through storytelling. As I've heard her say numerous times, having been a part of the class last semester, everyone has stories to share. Storytelling is a way to build connections, bridge divides and find shared humanity. And as I mentioned earlier, this past fall and this spring, students from UMass teamed up with us at Northampton Neighbors and participated in an intergenerational storytelling project. Today, Gloria will talk about the importance of stories in an increasingly disconnected world. When she finishes her presentation, we'll open it up to your questions. So please, you'll get a moment later on to put them in the chat so we can answer as many as we can. So I think that's enough of me. Gloria DeFulvio, welcome to Northampton Neighbors. It is great to be with you here today. Wow, thank you so much, Jane. That was a really great introduction. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here and I'm excited to share the work that I've been doing with Northampton Neighbors over the past year. Um, before I begin, I just wanna say um, a big thank you to the Northampton Speaker Series Committee for having me here today. Um, and to Diane Porcella and Marsha Holden, both for their unwavering support and hard work to make this program happen. Um, as Jane mentioned, I've been working in the field of public health and specifically community health for over 30 years um, and have been directing the undergrad program for about 11 years. Um, so I've been doing this, I've been doing a lot of different things, but a big part of my work in community health um, has focused on stories and storytelling. And today I'm going to focus on that work um, and the connection um, that I have with uh, Northampton neighbors um, and my students in this intergenerational storytelling project, which has been just uh, fantastic. So over the next um, the next 30 minutes, uh, I'll be talking about storytelling and its role in community connection. I'll talk to you um, about the seed for the idea for this class and how it uh, came to be. I'll talk a little bit about what we do in the classroom and uh, the importance of intergenerational storytelling and our connection with Northampton neighbors. I'll share a couple of stories from the fall semester and we'll talk about lessons learned 
And finally, I'll share my hopes and dreams for the future of this work. Uh, but first, so that I can convey to you how I became interested in stories and the importance of storytelling, let me tell you a story. When I was about uh, eight years old, uh, I remember sitting with my father on the front steps. Uh, it was a warm summer night and we had gone for a walk and had come back and found ourselves on the porch. And I don't remember, we maybe went for an ice cream cone. Um, maybe it was, we were just staying outside to enjoy the uh, cool breeze on a warm summer night. But my dad was a shy and reclusive man. So anytime I could find to connect with him, I took advantage of that time. And that night, for whatever reason, um, he decided to tell me a story. And um, the story he told me is what he called a sea story. And my eight-year-old little head, I couldn't for the life of me figure out what the letter C had to do with the story he was telling me. But um, in fact, he was in the Navy and he was telling me a story um, about his time at sea. But he proceeded to tell me about um, his time on the ship and I don't remember the details, but I remember there was rough waters and there was chaos and an explosion. Um, and, and even though I don't remember the details, most importantly, what I do remember is that moment. Uh, what I remember about that moment was um, the closeness that I felt to him when he was telling me that story, um, especially since he was largely inaccessible to me. And so while those details escaped me, um, I remembered enough about that story to help me understand him um, a little bit more clearly and to understand uh, the distance that he placed between himself and others was largely in part a result of his time um, in war and the trauma that he had experienced. So I'd like to say that that memory is what brought me directly to this work, uh, but life is way more complicated than that. And um, my professional life has gravitated in this direction um, to the importance and power of story. Um, no doubt it's partly in relation to the role that stories have played in my connecting um, with others. So let's talk about stories. Um, stories are time-honored traditions. Uh, we can share our experiences, our values, family lore with one another. They have uh, the power to shape the way we think about the world and then the way that we then interact with it. It's been used to connect, to engage, to inspire, to heal, to create brighter futures. Uh, stories are essential building blocks um, to build empathy and human connection. And they're a powerful tool for community building. When we hear a story or when we share a story with another person, we feel less alone in the world. Uh, and so, so stories have that power to help people feel that they belong and they help people feel seen. And Annie Brewster, a physician at Harvard, uh, says it really well here eloquently um, when she says, uh, when we witness story, when we witness someone else's vulnerability in a safe and supportive environment, we feel less alone and often just plain better. Stories connect us as human beings and build bonds between us. We need them now more than ever. So what does this have to do with public health? Um, you know, public health folks in my area recognize the importance of social connection to the health of individuals and to communities. Um, and a public health response to promoting social connection and belonging has a, a range of strategies. Um, social infrastructure, for example, creating spaces where people can connect and um, find each other. Uh, fostering more inclusive participation opportunities. Um, supporting healthy aging and aging in place uh, initiatives such as the Village Network. It's such a fantastic uh, structure. Um, media campaigns might be something we do in order to um, foster that sense of connection and belonging. Um, and then finally, the opportunities to share stories that matter. And it's this last strategy that I've spent a good amount of time working with over my career. Um, in the past, I've used storytelling in my work um, in a variety of settings. So for example, um, I worked with a group of um, breast cancer survivors to help them create three to five minute visual narratives, um, digital stories that they um, we combined into a larger movie that they then shared with their larger um, community and created discussions and um, shared uh, the various ways that breast cancer impacts people's lives. 
Um, I've worked with non-binary youth and helping them tell their stories in a similar way through these three to five minute visual narratives um, about some aspect of their life that they wanted to share. Um, and then that was put together and they had a community film and that um, power of bringing people together and to share a part of themselves that they hadn't been um, able to share in the past was just a really powerful um, moment. So these projects are useful um, to both the individual who is sharing their story as it helps them figure out um, an, um, uh, something that's important to them. Um, and it's also important for the listener who can connect to that story. And if we can find a way to um, archive those stories and share them with a lar larger audience, we can build uh, a larger community understanding um, and a shared experience in a, in a bigger way. So what to do with this uh, love for storytelling that I have along with a commitment to community building and community connection. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, I, it was actually just a little before the pandemic, I found this book written by the former and now current Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, it's called Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World. Um, and at the very beginning of the pandemic, Dr. Murthy, who wrote this book, um, went on tour, but because of, the, of everything shutting down, it was a virtual event and fortuitously for me, I, um, I attended and felt really connected to what he had to say. And I couldn't help but think how I wanted to bring this book into a class. So I went to my chair and I said, I'd like to create a one credit seminar, bring in the book, have people, have students together. We talk about what's in it. And um, that, that's it. And she said to me, you know, would you want to, would you consider making this a three credit class? And I was kind of like, mm, I, I don't know if I'm really up for that. Um, and well, to make a long story short, I had to teach a large class again for a year as we went into shutdown and um, I had a transition and introduction class to an online format. And so everything got pushed back a year. Um, but one of the things that I had time to think about was the way that Dr. Murthy talked about various uh, communities and groups and people who um, have been disconnected for various reasons and how um, right now we really are in a state of an epidemic of what he called an epidemic of loneliness. And um, that really struck me. Um, and so with that thinking um, and with that time to think, that became the title of my class, The Epidemic of Loneliness on Social Connection, Belonging, and Public Health. And um, I gave in to the three credit class idea because um, it's an important public health issue that currently isn't covered in our curriculum. Um, so besides sitting in a classroom and like theoretically talking about these issues, I wanted to give my students something um, to do that was more meaningful. Um, and it felt important that we not just isolate in an isolated classroom way, talk about connection, that they actually get to practice it. Um, I've been involved in community engaged learning almost as long as I've been teaching. So it made sense for me to give my students an opportunity to practice some of what they learned in the classroom. I also was keenly aware that our students really need an opportunity to learn from and connect to people outside of their peer group. And so in creating the classroom opportunity, I decided to have a three-pronged approach. That first, we would build intentional community within the classroom. We would incorporate storytelling and we would have an intergenerational component to the class. And so the reason I wanted the intergenerational component is that the research really talks about um, the benefits of this connection for both um, both generations involved. Um, it broadens our understanding of the world and each other. It helps us transmit cultural knowledge between seniors uh, in, in, at the university and seniors in um, a community. Um, it allows us to find commonalities across age differences um, and it facilitates reciprocal learning and skill building. Um, a couple of key elements for me in creating this project was that the learning would be mutually beneficial. It wouldn't just be about my students, um, but it would be beneficial to both volunteers and the students. And that um, the collection of the stories therefore would happen in a reciprocal way. So, so 
students would collect stories from seniors, seniors would collect stories from, from the students. So through a few fortuitous happenings, I connected with uh, Northampton neighbor director, Diane Purcella, and then um, she put me in touch with Marcia and Ken. We had a series of conversations um, and through those conversations, this class evolved. Um, and again, I didn't want just a connection to happen, which certainly was a main element. Um, I did want to incorporate the storytelling piece um, with the sort of forethought or forward thinking of um, this being a way to preserve life stories of, of community members um, while at the same time facilitating those meaningful interactions between people. So what happens in our classroom? We modeled this um, off of the StoryCorps uh, um, experience. I don't know if any of you, you may have um, heard StoryCorps through NPR or um, gone to their website or maybe participated in it yourself. Um, to do this, we have uh, the volunteer, the volunteers from Northampton Neighbors come into our classroom in a virtual way at the beginning of the semester where they get to hear about the class. They then at that point meet the student match that they're going to be connected to. They then meet together over the next six to eight weeks of the semester. They decide on their own timeline, how often, when they meet. Um, and you know, hopefully the relationship is building during that time. And then it culminates in a recorded story sharing. And if the participant chooses, that story can then be uploaded to the Library of Congress and would be available to future generations. So um, there's you know, a lot of sort of benefit in that process. The other component of the class is um, I invite the volunteers to read the book along with us. And then at two points during the semester, they join us uh, virtually again. Um, and there are small breakout rooms of people to have conversations about um, the contents of, the, of Dr. Murthy's book, uh, the Together book. So I wanted to share a pair of stories with you. Um, and while neither uh, Obi nor Ray are here today, uh, they both gave me permission to share their story. Uh, Obi and Ray had been meeting uh, once a week over Zoom last semester. And uh, they decided together, I, I leave this pretty open-ended for the student and the volunteer to decide how they want to share a story. And they decided that they would record a story about an influential person in their life. So I'm gonna share Ray's story first, where he talks about um, while in graduate school for physical education, one of his teachers introduced him to acting. Let's start with his story. So um, my English teacher my, in my freshman English class also happened to be the guy who ran the drama activities at Springfield College. This is 1961, we're talking. He was always trying to get the jocks to try out for the, because he never had enough bodies for the plays that he was doing. And I tried out for a play in that spring quarter of my freshman year. And I got a small part in um, a play called by Tennessee Williams called Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. So I got to see other plays that they did, which was an eye opener to me because I had never seen a play before, really. I'd never seen the live theater. I, I fell in love with the idea of making theater. It was imaginative. It was like you all created to, as a as a group of people. You created something, and that was imaginary, and you lived in it. And you got to express a part of yourself that might not be able to be expressed in the rest of your life. It seemed very magical to me. So anyway, I had decided. Well, I'm going to transfer and become an English major. But I also said, maybe there's some theater going on over at the junior college. Maybe they could do something in the summer. So I went over offering to work backstage, but they said, aren't you gonna try out for the plays? We do two plays in the summer. You, should, you ought to do that. So uh, I, I tried out for the first play and got a supporting role in it. I, I'm sure I was terrible, <laughs> but I did it and found it interesting. And then the guy who ran the, their theater program at the junior college, he uh, directed the second play that they did in the summer. And he cast me in the lead for that without me even having to audition. And as it turned out, I also, I got a, a headline in the paper, in the Flint Journal, a review. And it said, Burke scores in local play. In all the time I did athletics, 
I, there was no recognition at all. And suddenly I had a degree of public success that just blew me away. I had uh, uh, amazed me. It made me really turn my head around, not just to switch and become an English major. I wanted to study theater. And that fall, I suddenly was in Evanston at Northwestern University and found myself as a full-time theater student. My focus was to be acting, but I loved all aspects of working in the theater. After I finished graduate school, I did teach uh, at Southern Methodist University for uh, three years. And then that led into working in more professional situations. And eventually I left the educational theater behind and said, I, I want to try and see if I can't make it as a professional actor. There's the same kind of progression that you do there. That led to, you know, working in regional theater for 14 years which led to I wanted to work in a larger kind of framework. So I said, I want to do television and film. So we all moved to Los Angeles and I was there for 20 years doing TV and film and some theater. And after 20 years, um, we shifted and moved to the Twin Cities, or I still continue to, because they had a wonderful regional theater there, a really great the Guthrie Theater. And I worked there for 16 years and only occasional in television and film when something would come to town that I might get a part in. So I've been now a professional actor for a professional actor for 50 years and a student of acting for almost 60 years. My wife has always said that acting for me is a, uh, a practice. It's not a career as such. So it's more than just a way I earn my living. It's a way that has shaped me and fulfilled me as a human being. I think I said to you once that I'm a better actor because uh, of having a full personal life. I'm also a better person for having been an actor, I think. I've heard that story many times and I'm always very moved by that, um, by his reflection on, on his career. So Obi then talks about a teacher who believed in him. Um, and I will share Obi's story and then a little update on Obi that I heard just the other day. So when I was a kid, I'm gonna say sixth, seventh grade, I was definitely in the wrong crowd. Did not work hard, play too much, skip classes. It was all slowly accumulating and it really hit seventh grade. Seventh grade is when I stopped camera school. It was when um, I was emailing professors or teachers at the time, how can I bring my F to a C? Or how can I bring my D to a B? Two weeks before the semester ended. So, and I didn't really think of my future like that. Like if someone asked me where you see yourself in five years, I wouldn't know what to say. Eighth grade hit, beginning of eighth grade, I had an engineering teacher named Mr. Dawes. And I really liked this engineering class for some reason. It just made sense to me. And there was one time during lunch, mind you, I was, I was in the rambunctious group, you know? So lunchtime we'd be making noises, you know, throwing stuff, all that stuff. And I was in lunch with my friends and Mr. Dawes came out of nowhere. I was like, oh, be kind of talk to you. I was like, sure, yeah, what's up? So he, he pulled me aside in the hallway and was like, Obi, if I could be, if you want me to be completely honest with you, I can see you as a really great engineer in the future. And in my mind, I'm like, is he serious right now? Like, is he, is he telling me this? I come from a place that's predominantly white and doesn't really give any second thoughts to African-American kids other than sports. You know, the only compliments I had growing up was football related or sports related, never academic. And other kids like that looked like me never had any compliments academic wise. It was always sports. So this is the first time in a school setting where a teacher approached me and said, you can do this. Hmm. And it wasn't how to do with sports. It doesn't have to do with the game I had last weekend. It has to do with academics. So that really changed my perspective of life. Honestly, he said like, yo, like, I want you to be connected with me for the next couple of years and we can talk about this and hook up with people. And I'm like, I was starstruck. I was starstruck because a person that's older than me, who's not my immediate family, who looks different than me, who's a teacher in my school, really generally thinks that I can make it in academics. My life really changed academic wise to like, I got to kill it, not just for myself, but for the people who believed in me, my parents, this engineering teacher who really took the time and told me, you can do this. So for the past, like, for the next two years, I want to be engineer, like engineer, 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 I don't care what I'm doing. 
you know, wow. that I fell in love with biology and that faith that my engineering teacher instilled in me, it carried on to my new profound love for medicine and my goal to become a doctor. I've been riding that ever since. Of course, I found multiple reasons and multiple passions and multiple motives of why I want to become a doctor after that. But that one moment in the lunchroom, that one interaction I had with that engineering teacher yeah. really propelled me to be great in this. Um, I had an email exchange with Obi just the other day, and he um, has recently won the 21st Century Award here on campus, which is a big deal award. And he got into medical school at UMass Medical and will be attending in the fall. So that was great news to hear. So what are the lessons learned through this project so far? Well, I expected to, to enjoy this class, um, and I expected the students to find it um, interesting. Um, and I expected Northampton neighbor volunteers to think it was kind of, you know, get a kick out of meeting with students. Um, I wasn't quite prepared to, to actually love this class <laughs> um, and love the people that I've met through this class. Um, I've come to understand how deeply meaningful the class uh, on loneliness and social isolation um, has been for my students. Um, the students read the material, um, they soak it up, they related to it. Um, you know, loneliness was real for them and that was a bit of a surprise for me. And I can't overstate how important it was to build community with the students in the classroom. Um, we played games, we talked to each other, we shared stories. Um, and, and I think it's through those stories that, that sort of helped me understand and connect to students more. So it's just been a gift really. And then for the volunteers, I've also come to understand um, that this relationship was also really valuable. Um, that the opportunity to share a part of their life with someone who really knows nothing about them and to connect with someone from a younger generation has been inspirational and, and hopeful. Just a few quotes from um, students uh, over the last year that I've heard and, and recorded um, that they say the cultural norm is to be friends with people of their own age, but I learned you can reach outside of your group to make friends. Um, I learned to find commonalities, even though there's such a difference in age, we could find things we shared in common. I was able to learn from my match. She could give me advice different than parental advice. Um, she would talk about what she might do differently and in listening to her reflect upon her own experience. Um, I also learned about how I might do things. And something that I learned that and I will take away with me is how easy it is to create a connection with someone that you, that you do not know. It doesn't matter about their race, age, gender, socioeconomic status, anything. You will almost always share a common ground with someone. I've asked two people from the fall um, experience to be here today and to share a little bit about their experience. So Carolina Mello is here and I think Susie Brown is here. Um, so, although I don't see Susie anymore. <laughs> um, oh, there you are, great, awesome. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna turn the, um, the mic to you for a bit and you can um, say a couple of words. Okay, hello. Um, I guess I'll go first. So um, I, I was a senior when um, I got into this class and I was really intrigued by it because I hadn't seen anything like this on campus before. And it was also my first semester on campus after COVID. So it felt really um, significant during that time. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity to kind of see if anybody was going through the same thing that I was going through. And I did find that through the class. Um, when Gloria explained that we we're gonna be matched with somebody from um, Northamp Northampton Neighbors. Um, I was really nervous because I I didn't have as a, I'm very introverted and shy naturally. So I thought that I wasn't going to be able to um, um, share a story with somebody who I didn't really know, but I was really lucky to match with um, Susie and <laughs> we got along really well and we met over 
um, several weeks and just shared uh, little piece, little pieces of information about ourselves. I didn't really know what story um, I wanted to share with her at first, but um, through our interactions and kind of figuring out the things we had in common, I found like the story found me more than I found the story. And I felt really connected to her and felt like I could be really vulnerable in that space. And it honestly gave me like a new reflection <laughs> in life after I shared that moment with her. And I just really appreciate this class. I think it um, gives you a perspective into um, everybody's life. I mean, everybody has something to share. Um, and it's really easy to judge people um, by their age and their looks and um, their skin color, but uh, stories can help you connect with others. So thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Carolina. I just want to apologize. I tried to do this in the car and it didn't work. <laughs> because of uh, my computer lost battery. So I had to come inside and there's obviously ambient noise, but um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. So um, talk about connection. You know, we all came together after we had our pairs and did the experience. And the word magical as overused as it is and as cliche as it is, was repeated in couple after couple. And that's all I could think of. I couldn't think of a better description of what happened with Carolina and I. Um, we just connected. That she is shy never even occurred to me. And as we talked over a couple of weeks, I think it was two or three weeks, um, we just both came to the same um, awareness of what our theme was going to be. I think it was Carolina's idea to have a theme, but we both came to the same awareness at the same time of what our theme would be, which was transitions. So here is a 76-year-old white whatever, and there's Carolina, decades younger than me from a completely different culture. And we've already talked about this, you know, today, but it, it was really quite the connection. And we, I have, we started to think about what we would talk about, what our stories would be. And I started off with aging, because I'd been thinking about that. And I don't know what Carolina started off with, but we both ended up with the stories that touched us the most. So for me, is this okay, Carolina? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll leave it at that. I, I, we both ended up with the stories that really, really touched our heart. Um, and the effect of, I was so, I guess it's just me, but I was so intrigued by how this worked. I, in all my ancient years and doing a lot of many, many different things and working my whole life, doing outreach and community organization, I really never experienced anything like this. Um, there was so I was intrigued and I, I just need to say this that one of the reasons that all of us we each had an individual experience but we each had a commonality of that magic and I think one of the major reasons for that is that Gloria set up um, and I set up a um, expectation in the class from even her description of the course when people signed up, so before the class started, that this would be a unique class and that people would be expected to be vulnerable and to be open with each other. And so, and then we got paired up. So Carolina came to me with that basis and 
because she was so open and vulnerable. I'm not that way. Talk about shy. I, I responded in kind. Um, and the other aspect of this was here I am, you know, decades older, and Gloria had the students lead the classroom. I don't know if this was already broken up, brought up. And I think that was a very important element. It was wonderful for me. <laughs> so um, I don't want to go on and on. I just want to say that even beyond the class and, you know, I hope to stay in touch with Carolina. Um, I had, a, it, this really was a transformative experience and without going into how and why, because of this story and sending the story to a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in 30 years, who was really a soulmate, we got back in touch. So it, it just has effects upon effects. And I thank you, Carolina, and I thank you, Gloria. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both for uh, sharing that experience because I think it um, adds life to what I've been trying to um, share in this 30 minutes. So I'm almost done. I just have a couple more things I wanted to say. Um, someone the other day in our book group meeting asked um, if I had, if my relationships with my colleagues have changed since doing this class. And I was not really um, convinced that my colleague relationships have changed, but it certainly has changed me as a person overall and has changed my relationship with my students. Um, and I think part of that um, is um, because when we talk about story and you know what makes a good story, we also talk about authenticity. And for me, what this class has, has forced me to do is to really slow down and be intentional and authentically connect with my students. Um, and this notion that stories allow us to be seen, that became really sort of clear to me um, and important to me. And it's not just important when sharing stories, but recognizing that more and more we all have that need. Um, and um, this was a quote from the Murthy book that I think summarizes the importance of this project to me is helping people feel known, helping them feel seen and loved is perhaps the most powerful medicine we have. So in closing, um, I just hope that we can create an endless archive of local stories, uh, that we can find a way to share them more broadly. Um, right now I have a small uh, cadre of students. A couple of them are here. I saw Justin here, Carolina is still working with me, um, that, uh, that have been working on editing stories and uh, we're creating a little website that we hope can link to Northampton Neighbors website. Um, and I'm open to suggestions on how you think this could uh, grow or change or meet the needs of Northampton Neighbors um, uh, in a different way. I'll be teaching the class again in the fall. Uh, we'll have another 25 students. Um, and um, so think about signing up and volunteering. Um, and just on, in closing, I would like to, on behalf of my students and myself, uh, thank the Northampton Neighbors Board of Directors, um, and especially Marsha and Ken, who you know, really trusted me um, and were willing to allow me to partner with you all. Um, and Diana, uh, Diane Priscilla, um, for your enthusiasm and incredible work recruiting people into the program. Um, again, the Speakers Series Committee for inviting me and um, Jane and Nina for your help in making this um, presentation happen. Um, and of course, all of you who jumped in and volunteered to pair up with uh, the students and to share your stories and be a mentor and friend to our, um, to our class, thank you. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank my students for being adventurous and pushing your comfort zone and um, for teaching me, really. That was so wonderful. Thank you so much, Gloria. Wow, I'm so excited. And I know that um, for everyone who's with us today, you probably have some questions or thoughts about uh, or feelings about what came up. Now it's time for your questions. Uh, Nina's going to open up the chat function. So when that happens, please put your questions in there. And while we're gathering those, I just wanted to say, if you like what you're hearing, 
and you want to be more of a part of Northampton neighbors, or if you want to be part of Gloria's class next fall, um, there's room for you. Um, and if you'd like to contribute to Northampton neighbors, you can give your time, you can write a check, you can be part of one of our wonderful committees or part of the board. We're a small nonprofit and we exist to combat isolation among Northampton seniors and your energy and your help makes us do it even better. So while we're getting the, um, the chat function up and running and questions coming in, Gloria, um, I had a question for you that uh, really came out of some of the conversations we were having on our speaker series committee and also these amazing magical moments that Susie uh, and Carolina talked about and uh, this theme of transition that I love so much. Um, I wanted you to help us just switch gears a little bit and tell us if there was anything unexpected or surprising for you. I know you talked a little bit about some of the great gifts, but did anything, you know, as a researcher, you often have your own assumptions, but then you learn so many other realities. So anything unexpected or surprising? Um, I, for me, um, it was really surprising. I'll just start with my class, first of all. Um, it was really surprising to me about how much this topic of loneliness resonated with the students, right? I don't think of 19, 20, 21 year olds as feeling um, lonely. I didn't expect that to be why they took the class, really. I mean, maybe a little bit, but but really profoundly, we talked a lot about that. Um, and yes, the pandemic, but but even you know, I think they would say before the pandemic, finding themselves, finding their group. Um, so that really stood out for me. Um, I would say, and and I saw that Marsha would really love to take a minute to tell everyone about two expect unexpected outcomes. So um, I would love for her to do that. Yeah. Um, Nina, could you help us with that? And uh, I'm working bring on up, bring up Marsha Holden. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, I want to hear about that too. I I addressed the other comment. Of, and, yeah, I think so. Hi, Marsha. You can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. So um, one outcome is that the person I was paired with is a graduating senior and she does, it was a new term to me, but these seniors do things called capstone projects. And so she was so interested in storytelling that she is now we, like our first in, intern, she's an intern and she's working with the communications committee interviewing about it does. Oh, she interviewed you, Jane, right? Yeah, interviewing, um, interviewing Northampton neighbors. She knows just a little bit about each Northampton neighbor. She's interviewing them and it's complete selfishness on our part because in the communications committee, we, our dream is to have an archive of these um, of, of statements from people and also photographs so that we can then use in our year in review coming up. So that's happening. And then um, it's, we have a new program that just mushroomed. And I don't know about the direct connection, but it's called Sandwiches and Stories. Mm -hmm. So there again, you know, it's the power of stories. And mm -hmm. it had its first meeting last week and 19 people showed up, which <laughs> was, oh, we went, what? You know, this <laughs> is wonderful. So it's affirmation for you, Gloria. And I just want to say this publicly. I'm a teacher myself. And what happened in your classroom doesn't just happen without a lot of work. So it was interesting for me to hear today some of the things you did, playing games, telling your own stories, whatever. But those, those students of yours were so prepared to take this on. And you know, just kudos to you. It's, it's mm -hmm. been just an honor. And I'm so excited that it's going to keep going on. Yay. Yeah. Thank great. you so much. For, That's so great. Yeah. Thank you um, so much, Marsha, because really you all trusted me a little bit more than <laughs> like <laughs> we did. <laughs> you didn't know me yeah. at all. Um, um, but yeah, but I, you answer emails right away. <laughs> <laughs> and I just also want to clarify that like we don't play like checkers games. <laughs> we play, you know, we play games that sort of help us develop. Um, 
relationships. <laughs> um, so anyway. You know, it would be fun to learn yeah. more about that. Actually, yeah. I'll be emailing you. Okay. So thanks, Marcia. That's so cool. Somebody put in the chat um, a question about how to get involved in the course. So if you could um, give us some information about that, that'd be great. Here's yeah. another question for you, Gloria. Can you offer us any tips for naturally collecting and storing stories from our own families and our own tribes and our mm -hmm. own people um, to give us some ideas about how we can begin to do this? Yeah. Um, so StoryCorps, ha like they ha I'm sure there are other programs like this, other um, applications like this, but StoryCorps has a very easy way of um, providing you, providing people with tools and some possible questions. Um, and so you right on their website, you can um, log in and sort of um, get more information about how to um, how to do this on, on your own, right? Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, cool. And I would say, can I just say one thing about um, if you're interested in the course, I, I don't know, I'm maybe putting her on the spot, but um, Diane sort of collects that information <laughs> um, for me and that would be the greatest um, thing. You certainly can email me, um, it's gloria at umass.edu, um, but, but probably the best way is through Diane who will gather that info. That's great. Thank you, Gloria. And thank you, Diane, as always. It's great. So glad you're with us. Hey, um, Gloria, another question that came up is what um, one of the themes that Susie and Carolina talked about was transition. What were some of the other common themes to the stories that seniors tell? Was it a lost love? Was it a lost friendship? Was it happy moments, sad moments, greatest challenges? What were some of those? Um, this is where I would love to have people pop in and share what they're sharing, um, but it might not be that easy. It seems that most people can't mute and unmute themselves. So um, I'll try to remember some of that. Um, you know, it really varied. Someone in the chat asked what the parameters for shaping a story um, were, and they're, they're, I didn't give many, um, which I think stressed some people out, but also um, you know, I worked with my students to sort of alleviate that, <laughs> try to alleviate that anxiety. Um, so um, we had uh, stories on, you know, who is most important to you, who is an important person in your life, um, how, you know, um, uh, what are some things, uh, tell me about the pandemic and what that was like for you. That was an, a common theme. Um, we had people talk about, you um, uh, love. We had people talk about, um, uh, you know, I had um, a pair I considered sharing their story who who just had the same questions for each other, right? Like, what um, what was the pandemic like for you? What is um, um, something that you've learned over these last couple of years? So really, the stories just vary mm -hmm. so broadly, um, and I and I liked uh, that. Oh, um, that actually leads us to another question that Jan Levy just asked, which I love. What are your parameters for sharing and shaping a story? Yeah, um, I, I, I try to not give too many parameters. Again, it's totally stressful for some people. <laughs> um, but but you know, we do go. A lot, we talk a lot about like plot and um, reflective moment, so that the story can loop. Um, back on itself that that a story really becomes a story when we can think about the meaning it had for us. So um, I try to work with students a lot with that. Um, and I, this year I shared some slides um, with the name with the volunteers as well about like different types of stories and some common um, ways to think about it. Um, so and I see McKenna said in the chat some stories. Yeah. Highlighted study abroad trips. Yep, thank you, McKenna, for being my memory. McKenna is a student um, from the fall. Um, grandparents, family dynamics during the pandemic, childhood memories, and college experiences. Oh, that's great. So we can we have just a few minutes left, but Nina, we could let people unmute themselves. Um, if somebody would like to ask a question with your own voice, um, if you unmute yourself, we can find you or you could raise your hand maybe let's see if I can do this 
or Nina, maybe you could help me. I see Linda Desmond's hand went up. Linda, okay. hi. Hi, um, Gloria, that was fantastic. Um, I, I feel um, my background is gerontology. I, I just feel so excited about um, this, you know, sort of um, really structured initiative. You know, I've been doing intergenerational programming for 50 years, you know, but I, this is, um, this is extraordinary. Um, I'd love to like, you know, talk to you um, further on this and, um, you know, and introduce it to AARP. I'm now on their executive council in Massachusetts. They should go farther. Right. You know, and then we also during, um, under, um, um, we have a new a program in Northampton Neighbors called the Pioneer Valley Memory Care Initiative, where we work with people with dementia and their carers. Um, and I'm just wondering, are have you considered doing something, you know, from a, a more specific area, like, you know, because I think this would be incredibly valuable um, for people with memory loss. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I've thought about a lot of different ways to like be very specific with stories, right? So like um, focus on a particular community, um, like those facing memory loss um, or like health stories more broadly. And so it's just been a little bit easier to be very um, open and fluid right now, but I'm definitely open to thinking about also more targeted um, opportunities as well. Great, well, congratulations, I love it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Linda. Anybody else just dying to ask a question before it hits the top of the hour? Anyone? I'm trying to look around. Ah, I see you, Barbara Smith. Yes, I saw you. Great. I was just gonna uh, make a comment. Um, this is my second time doing it um, with students. And I think the magic of it is that I sudden I did not feel an age difference. That was, and every once in a while I'd stop and realize, oh, I'm older than his grandmother most likely is. I'm doing it with this wonderful young fella. And that to me is wonderful, just to talk with another human being one-on-one -on -one, and we have 50 years difference and it really didn't matter. So I find that very, that was great. That's, That's awesome. awesome. That's Fantastic. Great. There's two comments in the chat, if I could just read them. One was from Diane that said, um, what I heard from participants was the value of time well spent in the program, but also how it changed how they thought, spoke, and listened outside of the program too. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and then Edie, um, said, Edie Kirk, who is currently in this semester, said um, that she did a story about her mother. I made notes and sent them to my sister and brother and asked for their corrections if my memories were inaccurate. This turned into a great sibling experience. I love great. that. That's thank beautiful. You, oh, thank you, Edie. That's great. That's a great note to end on, I think. What do you think, Gloria? Any last um, tips or words? No, uh, it's been a great offer? experience for me. I'm just so thrilled that it's been great for um, others as well, both students and, um, and volunteers. And thank you for my students for showing up today because I know you didn't have to, I didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I'm really appreciative of your being here um, as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Gloria, what a treat to have this time with you. And as I said earlier, you know, there's possibilities for you to get involved if you haven't been, um, or if you have and you want to do it again, <laughs> that's great. Um, thank you uh, again. And um, just, Thanks to everyone for being with us today. Thanks to our speaker series committee. We love you. You, I love being on this committee. Um, thanks to Nina. We love you and we can't do any of this without you. But a really a special thanks to you, Gloria DiPolvio, for all you do to make the world a more connected place for all of us. If you like Northampton Neighbors, you want to be a part of us even more, um, uh, let us know because we are always looking to grow. So I think that's just about the top of the hour. It's just big, uh, big hands for Gloria. Thank you again. Thanks to all the students for being here. Thanks for all the seniors, seniors on both sides for being a part of this. It's just <laughs> great. There's the website Dan just put in the chat. And um, we'll see you next month. And I have been, um, actually, I have not done my job. Uh, is anyone else from the speaker series uh, committee here to tell us what our next speaker is? Because 
I didn't put it down in my notes. I'm so sorry. Uh, is Naomi here? Still yeah, I'm still here. Or? Um, Sarah is running the next talk, and I saw okay. Sarah earlier. Sarah, you want to? You want to? I am here, and and just a minute. I'm trying to get the title. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Hang on just Thank a minute, you. and I will get you the title. <laughs> I have been remiss. I'm so sorry. Just a minute. It's Christopher Clark. Right, and he's. He's, I cannot find the exact title right now. But Here it he, is. I've got it. Um, okay. Hmm. Or give us the uh, topic. How's that, sir? To, to live in the common cause, activism and community at the Northampton Association. It Fantastic. should be um, a really interesting talk. And it's our final talk for the semester. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> um, because we're taking a break for the summer and we'll be back in the fall. So we hope Good. you all come to hear Christopher Clark. And I just want to say one more thing. Listening to you, Gloria, you know, I heard from so many of the neighbors who participated how incredible you were. But listening to you today, not everybody could run this course. The ways in which you responded to people, your sensitivity, your openness is pretty stunning. So I, I thank you for that. Thank you. That's really good. Mm -hmm. well said. Thanks, Naomi. So glad that we did this. Let me say one more thing in case that title didn't mean anything to you about Christopher Clark. It's about the about Florence's utopian community in the 1840s, which was um, where you know that Sojourner Truth uh, was involved in the community and was very involved in abolitionism. And it was a community that believed and practiced equality in um, race, class, and gender. So a really inspiring example for us today. And on May 6th, as Diane just put in the chat. Fantastic. So that'll be the end of our season. And then we'll start up our next season in the fall. Thanks again, everyone, for being with us. Thanks, students. Thanks, Gloria. And thanks, everyone who's been involved. Take care, you all. See you next month.